Photoredox chemistry is a branch of chemistry that involves the use of light to drive chemical reactions, and are typically mediated by a class of molecules called photocatalysts, which absorb light and use the energy to facilitate an electron transfer. Photoredox reactions have gained significant attention in the field of chemistry, due to their potential to selectively synthesize complex molecules. They can perform chemical transformations that are difficult to achieve using traditional methods, especially on molecules that contain functional groups that are sensitive to many harsh reaction conditions. A new class of compounds that has been developed for use in photoredox reactions are alkyl bis silicates. These compounds have shown excellent performance in a range of photoredox reactions, such as thioetherification, aerylation and vinylation. Compared to other methods, using this new class of compounds has been shown to significantly improve the efficiency and selectivity of these reactions. So in this video, I will show how the new silicates are made and try out a reaction using blue LEDs. So I set up a stir plate and an ice bath. I lower a flask into the ice bath and put in a stir bar. I then add 180 ml of pentane as the solvent and 21 ml of pyridine as the base for this reaction. Then I add 10.5 ml of methanol, which is one of the reactants. Now I attach a dropping funnel and into the dropping funnel I first add 37 ml of pentane, which will dilute the second reactant, so that the reaction doesn't proceed too vigorously and the addition can be better regulated. Now to the pentane in the dropping funnel, I add 11.5 ml of cyclohexyl trichloroxylane, which is the second reactant for this reaction. I stopper the funnel and then slowly start adding in the reagent from the dropping funnel. Immediately a white precipitate forms, which is pyridine hydrochloride. This is because the pyridine in the mixture is a base that is able to bind hydrochloric acid that is formed during the reaction. The pyridine hydrochloride is insoluble in the solvent and thus precipitates out as a white solid. In the full reaction, the chlorine atoms from cyclohexyl trichloroxylane react with methanol to produce hydrochloric acid, which is taken up by the pyridine. After the reaction, all the chlorine atoms are replaced by methoxy groups to produce cyclohexyl trimethoxysilane. When the addition is done, the reaction mixture has turned completely white, and I just leave it to stir for a few more minutes. After that, I remove the dropping funnel and the ice bath and then leave it to stir for a few hours at room temperature to make sure that the reaction is complete. When that is done, I move the reaction mixture to a separatory funnel with the help of some more pentane. I then add water to take up all of the pyridine hydrochloride. I shake the mixture and then separate the layers. I then extract the water layer twice more with some pentane to take out any product that might have moved into the water layer. I then wash the combined pentane layers twice with a 2 molar hydrochloric acid solution, which will react with any remaining pyridine and take it into the water layer. I then wash it with a saturated sodium bicarbonate solution to destroy any remaining acid. I then wash it with some water to remove any remaining sodium bicarbonate and other salts. And as last, with a saturated sodium chloride solution to remove some of the water that is present in the pentane. When the extractions and washings are finished, I take the combined pentane layers and add in 25 grams of sodium sulfate, which will hold onto most of the remaining water. I then filter it through some cotton and set the filtered up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the pentane. When all of the pentane is gone, I am left with a clear liquid, which is cyclohexyl trimethoxysilane. The yield turned out to be 12.36 grams or 93%, which is basically the same as the literature even though I didn't do it in an inert atmosphere like them. Anyhow, now with this product, we can move on to the next reaction. So I set up a new flask and drop in a stir bar, and then add in 13 grams of catechol as the first reagent, and dissolve it in 75 mL of THF. To this solution, I add 10.2 mL of diisopropylamine as a second reagent. Then on top of that, I add in all of the cyclohexyl trimethoxysilane I just made. I dilute the mixture with 50 more mL of THF and then set the flask in a heating mantle and attach a condenser. I start heating the mixture to a reflux and then leave it for a day. In the reaction, the hydroxyl groups from catechol will react with the methoxy groups and produce methanol. Since there are only three methoxy groups to react with, one hydroxyl group of the catechol instead gives up a hydrogen atom to diisopropylamine and binds to the silicon, giving it a net negative charge, while the diisopropylamine now has a net positive charge. These charges can balance each other to form the salt diisopropyl ammonium bis cyclohexyl silicate. Anyhow, when I come back, the mixture has turned completely white. This is because the product is precipitating out of solution. But because of the formation of methanol during the reaction, as time goes on, it will disfavor the formation of the product because there's too much methanol around and the reaction comes to a standstill 
when in equilibrium. To fix this issue, I first have to remove all of the solvent from the mixture, with short path vacuum distillation. When all of it is gone, I am left with a white solid. Now that also all of the methanol is gone, the reaction can be restarted to get a better yield. So I add in 50 ml of THF as the solvent, and then add in 5 ml of diisopropylamine. The cyclohexyl trimethoxysilane is still present in the mixture, as I didn't distill over, so I don't have to re-add that. I reflux the mixture again for a day, and when that is done, I remove all of the solvent again. Now I am left with a white solid, that has some pink impurity. At this point, I left it in the fridge for a few days to work on later, and when I came back to use it, it had turned even more pink. Now to remove this impurity, I add 200 ml of diethyl ether and shake the flask to make the solid come loose. We see that the colored impurity dissolved and colored the solution red. Now I filter the mixture through a glass filter to collect the solid, but the solid is still a little bit pink from the impurity. So I wash it twice more with some diethyl ether. This has gotten rid of pretty much all of the pink impurity and I leave it to dry on the filter for a few minutes. After that, I am left with 22.11 grams of diisopropyl ammonium bis cyclohexyl silicate as a dry white powder, which is a yield of 85%. The literature had a yield of 96%, but they restarted the reaction like 4 times, and I didn't care to waste my time doing that for such a small difference. So now that the reagent has been made, I can move on with preparing the catalyst for the photoredox reaction. So I set up a flask in a heating mantle and add in a stir bar. I then add in 10 grams of nickel 2 chloride hexahydrate. On top of that, I add 30 ml of 1,2 dimethoxyethane and 14.4 ml of trimethyl orthoformate. I then attach a condenser and heat it to a reflux. The mixture quickly turns yellow, which is because of the formation of the product, nickel 2 chloride DME, which precipitates out of solution. In this reaction, nickel 2 chloride and 1,2 dimethoxyethane can complex with the help of trimethyl orthoformate to form the nickel 2 chloride dimethoxyethane complex, or nickel 2 chloride DME for short. I leave it to reflux for a day, and when I come back, it has a green-yellow color. I allow it to cool down and then filter it all through a glass fitted funnel. I wash the residue with some pentane and afterward I am left with 1.84 grams of nickel 2 chloride DME, which is a yield of 20%. I actually misread the procedure and it should be done with triethyl orthoformate and not methyl, so I'm okay with this yield. It should be a yellow powder, which it is, but the camera somehow does a horrible job in picking it up in this light and makes it look more green. A picture from my phone gives a better representation of the color in real life. Now I will prepare the second catalyst. So I set up a new flask in a heating mantle and add in a stir bar. I add 40 ml of ethanol and then add in 0.5 grams of tris bipyridine ruthenium 2 chloride that I made in a previous video. I then add in 10 grams of potassium hexafluorophosphate, which is in a large excess. I then heat it to 40 C and leave it for 30 minutes. In this simple reaction, the chloride ions are replaced by hexafluorophosphate ions to produce the hexafluorophosphate salt of the ruthenium bipyridine complex. When that is done, I let it cool down to room temperature and then filter it through a glass filled funnel. I wash it several times with a bunch of water to remove all of the potassium hexafluorophosphate and then once with ethanol and ether. When that is finished, I am left with 0.4 grams of tris bipyridyl ruthenium 2 hexafluorophosphate, which is a yield of 60%. The conversion should be pretty much 100%, but it's easy to lose a large percentage when working with such small amounts. Side by side, we can see how much the color has changed, compared to the chloride. Now that all of the reagents have been made, we can finally start the photoredox reaction. But first, I have to set up a reaction chamber to do the reaction in. So I thought of something simple and bought an RGB LED strip. And I also have this random container. My idea was to just stick the LED strip along the sides of the walls facing inward and I can just lower the flask inside and wrap it in aluminum foil and do the reaction like that. So that's what I did, and when it's finished, it looks like this. It didn't stick very well to the container, so I kinda gave up towards the end, but it should be good enough. Now that all of that is done, I can finally start the photoredox reaction. So I set up a flask and add in 200 mg of 4,4-dithert-butyl 2,2-dipyridyl as a ligand. I then add 170 mg of the nickel 2 chloride DME complex that I made before. I add 15 ml of THF as a solvent and add it in a stir bar. Now I stir it for a bit to get it mixed and then heat it with a heat gun to get everything to dissolve and allow the nickel to ligate with the ligand. I then pull a vacuum on the flask and pull out all of the solvent, which leaves behind a light green coating of the ligated nickel complex. 
I then open the flask again and add in 1.9 ml of 4 bromo anisole as the first reagent. The needle managed to get clogged, so I had to take it off, resulting in a not so elegant addition. I then add 100 ml of DMF as a solvent and stir it to give a green solution. I now add 5.89 grams of the silicate reagent that I made before and the solution turns a dark green. And as the final ingredient, the hexafluorophosphate salt of the ruthenium bipyridine complex, which will serve as the photocatalyst, which colors the solution dark red. Now that everything has been added, I can start the reaction. So I lower the flask into the photoreactor and let it sit there for two days while stirring. I cover everything in aluminum foil to trap the light and then leave it to react. In this reaction, a complex cycle of reactions happen. If you're interested in the full picture, you can read the literature in the description. In short, the photons from the LEDs excite the ruthenium complex, which causes it to transfer an electron. This initiates a cycle of reactions, where ruthenium complexes can constantly generate electrons and pass them to the ligated nickel complex, which works to couple the silicate and the aryl halide and gets regenerated by the transfer of electrons from the ruthenium complex. In the end, we should be left with the product 4 cyclohexyl anisole. When I come back, I take out the flask and the mixture has become a bit darker. Unfortunately, the stopper was stuck, so I had to sacrifice this flask to continue. I smashed the neck with a hammer to get it open. I then dilute the mixture with 50 ml of ethyl acetate and set up a filter. I put in a layer of sea light and a paper filter on top. I then filter the mixture through and wash it with some more ethyl acetate. Pretty much nothing was left behind in the filter, so this step might not have been necessary. I then set the filter up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the solvents. When that is done, I am left with a thick red oil. I add about 150 ml of ethyl acetate and dissolve as much of it as possible. I added a bit more of ethyl acetate and then moved it all to a separatory funnel. I wash it twice with some saturated sodium bicarbonate solution and once with some water. I then take the ethyl acetate layer and I dry it with some sodium sulfate and then filter it to remove it again. I set the filter up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the ethyl acetate and after that I am left with a dark red oil. Now to get the product, I have to do column chromatography, so I add some 5% ethyl acetate in hexanes to dissolve it. The polar components in the residue don't dissolve very well in this solvent mixture, but the product will, so it forms two layers. I then set up a column and add in 150 grams of spherical silica gel that I mixed with the element. I put a layer of sand on top and let the solvent level lower into the sand. I then use a pipette to put all of the product mixture on top. I let the product mixture lower into the sand and then put a bunch more eluent on top. I apply pressure on the top of the column with the exhaust of a vacuum pump and run the column until my desired product comes off. When that is done, I combine all of the fractions that should contain the product and I distill off all of the solvent with short path vacuum distillation. After all of the solvent was gone, I was left with a tiny bit of clear liquid which should be the product. The spot on the TLC is where it should be, but unfortunately I don't have an NMR to characterize the product properly. Still, we can reasonably assume that we have at least created some of the product. Anyhow, the yield is quite a bit lower than the literature, so it is possible that my LED setup was just trash, and I also didn't do it in an inert atmosphere like that. Anyhow, that was it for this video. Thanks for watching, and as always, a special thanks to my Rotovap support group on Patreon. See ya!